um, and and again, um, reporters all reporters from various publications are in the courtroom. They're hearing it. They're seeing it. It's a court record. Bob Lachance gets up on the stand and says he was never afraid of me, and in fact, he was the one that was doing the assaulting. And that if anybody's the hero in this room, it's John he actually Cosolino. said that. He actually yeah. said that, and <laughs> that, uh, and so on and so forth, and. Um, then we took a break. Uh, then they came back and they uh, offered us, they wanted to offer me a deal where if I pled guilty to discharge of a firearm in a non residential structure, they would make it non dangerous, non repetitive, and that I would be probation eligible. And you have to understand at this point, I'm looking at eight, eight, eight to 20 years in prison yeah. and, and with a wife and four children at home. And my youngest at that point was still 7, 16, or my oldest was 16, my youngest was, was 8. Still That's kids. not a good thing to be looking yeah. at. So I discussed it with my family, and uh, it was agreed upon that I should probably take this deal because of the probation situation. Um, up until this point, the county didn't want to deal with us at all, but what had happened was is it came out in deposition that when my attorney at the time brought up that these videotapes of the, the deposition uh, were missing all this information. All these pieces were in the puzzle were gone. Wow. That they'd been erased. And that where were the backup tapes? Oh, yeah. That one of the, in depositions, one of the detectives says, oh, yeah, we have plenty of backup oh. tapes. Well, what happened was when we were in court, we requested those backup tapes, and now all of a sudden there weren't any. But he had already gone on record wow. saying there was, but now they don't, there isn't. It just keeps so, rolling. It just kept snowballing on them. So they decided to offer me this deal. And again, I discussed it with my family. And, uh, you know, we just, it, in a looking hindsight, it was a big mistake. But I said, okay, we'll do it. And I pled guilty to the discharge of an, a non residential structure. Um, non, it was non dangerous, non repetitive, but it was a felony three. Hmm. And, so then what happens, uh, we, you know, it's great. They leave me out on bond and they set the sentencing date. So they get a probation report done and Joe Arpaio writes this incredible letter telling him, telling the court that I am a dangerous, psychotic individual, <laughs> that I have threatened to kill him, mm -hmm. that I'm an assassin, and that I should be given eight years in prison. Well, recommendation from the sheriff. Right. Ooh. So naturally, we all went, whoa. So we tried to withdraw my plea. Right. We wanted to go back to trial. Mm -hmm. was, no, this isn't happening because this is a setup for sure. Yeah. And we went in front of Judge Aceto, and we didn't, at the time, didn't realize, but Judge Aceto is in Joe's pocket. All right. So he refused the motion and mm -hmm. wasn't going to let me out and go back to trial. So we said, okay. So we go to my sentencing, and the funny thing is, is Bobby Ayala, a candidate for sheriff, gets up and speaks in my behalf. Bob Lachance, mm -hmm. the original attacker in this right. whole, whole situation, speaks on my behalf. Uh, Melody Nordman speaks in my behalf. Pearl Wilson. What more does it take? Um, Pearl Wilson. Who's Linda Seville, their Jimmy children Seville's died. sister that, you know, the situation with Jimmy Seville, where he was set up as, a, as supposedly a bomb threat on Joel, which was all fabricated by the Sheriff's Department. And they kept that boy in prison or county jail for almost three years over that until he was acquitted and finally sued and won multi-million multi dollars from. But at any rate, all these people went to my sentencing and said, this is nuts, this is crazy. How can you do this to this man and his family? Um, well, Judge Cito didn't care. He gave, I mean, I guess he did care because he could have given me, uh, you know, eight years in prison for just the discharge of a firearm. But he sentenced me to four months, ironic, he sentenced me to four months in the county jail on the work furlough program. Okay. Which means I can go home every day, go to work, but I have to come back and spend my nights in yeah. the tents. And, oh, the tent too. Right. Yeah, yeah, nice. special. yeah, especially. Yeah. You know, and this is you know this is in the winter time, so it's out there, and you're wearing three sweats, three pair of sweats, and and three jackets and boots just to try to stay warm. The pink they underwear give you, and socks uh, don't yeah, really help much. Yeah, they don't. 
because you're they give you one blanket and it's you know 20 degrees outside mm -hmm. kind of thing oh yeah um, and uh, so I'm in the situation for I'm in tents and I'm doing my work for a little program and what's funny is now I'm not even in there on a drug related charge but about every two or three days I'm being called into the office when I come back from work and I'm being drug tested and alcohol tested and I'm clean every test 10 12 tests I'm clean you know better I don't do drugs so all of a sudden one day I come back from work and I'm called in to do this test and uh, so I pee in the cup, right? And uh, they do their little thing in their little test kit. And then the, the, the detention officer, detention officer Brandt, disappears in the back room. Hmm. And he's gone for probably 20, 30 minutes. And he comes out of the back room and he tells me, you're getting rolled up. You're dirty with methamphetamine. And I'm looking at him, and I'm so, I just, my first reaction is I looked at him and said, bullshit, I want to be tested again. Mm -hmm. Good. Because I know better. Come on. No. And I'm looking at the sergeant, and I'm saying, sergeant, you know this is bullshit. You know it. I know it. I want to be tested again. So then, then they make me sit there and wait, and they call some lieutenant in. And he says, no, we're not testing me, and he's dirty. So they roll me up. And they throw me in the hole. And I'm, now I'm going to lose my job because I, once you're in the hole, that's where you do the remainder of your time. Mm -hmm. And I got 90 days left, which means I lose my job, I lose my house, which is all their game, their goal anyway, well, yeah, is you. to take as much away from me as I, they can. So about four hours, that five hours that I'm in the hole, uh, probation department comes and pulls me out. And I says, what's going on? They put me in a car, they handcuff me, put me in a car, and they're driving me somewhere. And I'm saying, well, well, what's going on here, guys? And they said, we got a call from a sergeant that didn't like what happened and told us we should test you oh. again. Wow. And when you read the stories, the, the trial and the false positive in uh, the, the New Times, the new times. You'll, you'll know. It'll tell the story. Because it's all documented. All right. So they take me to task. They test me. They didn't give me the results. They take me back to jail and they said, well, we'll have the results in a couple of days and we'll let you know. Because I'm asking them, well, you know, I'm going to lose my job. I'm not dirty. I'm not doing drugs. This isn't right because you're going to cost me my house. I've got a family out there. What do they do? Just move into the street? 